Hello everyone and welcome back to another Space News Rundown with me. We've got lots to talk about guys, we've got great news and progress from SpaceX down at Starbase with their Starship vehicle, but then we've got some bad news to talk about with SLS, Firefly, Aerospace and Virgin Galactic. And then we've got some upcoming Chinese and Soyuz launches to discuss, so really not much point dragging out the intro for much longer, so let's get right along to our first segment, all the news that happened last week regarding SpaceX's Starship. Ship 20 remains at the center of most discussion surrounding SpaceX Starship because of course Ship 20 will be the first vehicle that makes it all the way into orbit, hopefully on Starship's first orbital flight test which is getting tantalizingly close to getting a date. My fingers are still crossed for October but we'll just have to wait and see. At the moment Ship 20 is constantly covered in cherry pickers as engineers work tirelessly to make sure that its thermal protection system is both installed and, you know, safe and correct. <laughs> quite a lot of the tiles are sporting either green or red labels. It's not quite clear what these colors mean, but the leading theory is that if it's a red label, it means that the tile is damaged or, you know, cracked and needs replacing. And a green label means that the tile is okay, but it just needs to have its alignment adjusted. And then of course, the tiles that have okay written on them, presumably mean that those are okay. And as you can see from this progression of pictures here, the number of tiles with colored markers on them are rapidly decreasing and the number of okay tiles are rapidly rapidly increasing, so things are looking good for that October launch date if we are so lucky to be blessed. <laughs> and what a blessing it'll be to see this massive rocket finally take flight. In Elon's own words, this is the holy grail of rocketry. And in case you're new around here and not quite sure why this vehicle is so significant, it's because this is going to be the first fully reusable orbital class launch vehicle, which has never ever been done before. This is like the holy grail of rocketry, okay? 100%. Some of you might be thinking that the space shuttle was reusable, but first of all, it basically had to be completely refurbished when it came back to Earth. But crucially, the space shuttle itself wasn't the only part of the vehicle. We also have the gigantic orange tank, which was expended. The solid rocket motors did splash down and were recovered, but they basically needed to be completely disassembled, cleaned, refurbished, and then reloaded with solid propellant for reuse, which isn't really a reusable vehicle in my mind. That's again, a refurbishable vehicle. Now, SpaceX Starship will land be refueled and in theory will be able to launch within 24 hours of landing. Admittedly we probably are quite a few years from getting such a rapid turnaround rate but it's still amazing to see such a revolutionary vehicle get built right before our eyes in full view as well. If this works like Elon hopes it will, it will absolutely devastate the current landscape of rockets. And it's not surprising that other launch companies have realized this and have started working on their own reusable launch systems, all the way from Blue Origin's Jarvis system, which looks very Starship. And we have this concept from Relativity Space, which again, looks very Starship. But I think for me personally, it's not even the fact that the vehicle can land itself, which is the most impressive thing. I mean, at the end of the day, we've already seen the Falcon 9 land on a boat, which can we just take a moment to realize that that's actually amazing? Like we, we've kind of got used to it in a sense, because the Falcon 9 has got such a reliable track record at this point but sometimes I have to just watch the footage and think this is actually still this is still really amazing to watch this happen everyone said this was impossible when SpaceX said they were going to try and do this and now look Falcon 9 makes the rest of the industry look like they're stuck in the Stone Age and now Starship's about to do the same for Falcon 9 Sorry, bit of a tangent there. Like I say, the most impressive thing to me is not the fact that the rocket can land itself like Falcon 9, but it's the fact that it won't have landing legs. Instead, so-called Stage Zero, which is the ground infrastructure, launch tower, launch table, and GSE tanks, will actually catch the rocket out of the air using two giant chopstick arms nicknamed Mechazilla, and then they'll reposition the rocket back onto the launch table ready for refueling ahead of the next flight. Now, we're not going to see that happen for Booster 4 and Ship 20, which is going to be the dynamic duo that performs the first orbital flight test, but Elon has now confirmed on Twitter that SpaceX plan to put this system to the test with Booster Number 5, which will be the very next rocket we'll see launched from Starbase, and as you can see from Brendan Lewis's latest diagram, work has already begun on both Booster 5 and Ship 21. GSE tank number 8 is also very close to completion, which is very exciting because this is the final ground support equipment tank that needs to be completed in order to support the launch of Ship 20 and Booster 4. We were of course treated to seeing the full stack of Ship 20 and Booster 4 back last month, and it was and still is an amazing sight to behold. But of course since then it was all taken apart again since this was only a fit test, Booster 4 was rolled back into the high bay and Ship 20 has been sat at the suborbital launch site for a little while now after a brief 
brief stint back at the construction zone. At the time of me recording this, Ship 20 doesn't have any Raptor engines attached to it, but this statement might be untrue by the time this video comes out, because today, three Raptor engines were sighted en route to the vehicle, meaning that we probably won't have to wait too long at all to start seeing really exciting things like cryo testing and static fire ahead of the launch. Booster 4 is still sat in the high bay undergoing plumbing and wiring, and it's not quite clear exactly when it'll roll out to the launch site. One other thing I wanted to quickly mention was last week I talked about how the quick disconnect arm was attached to the launch tower, but when I released the video we didn't actually have any footage yet of it without any crane support, so here is a picture of it without any crane support. So that's, that's attached to the tower. The quick disconnect arm will of course provide a means of both refueling the Starship vehicle and of course will provide stability on the launch pad. The other arm that's yet to be attached to the tower is the aforementioned Mechazilla, which of course is going to be the system that catches the orbital booster. It's currently sitting on the ground in a mostly complete state, so hopefully it won't be too long at all before we get to see this one attached to the tower as well, and things will really, really start to come together. All in all, everything to do with Starship is, as always, very exciting, but right now, unfortunately, a lot of the progress is just things like heat shield inspection, things like that, so that's going to be the main focus for a little while. But once all that's done, we should be able to go back to business as usual of static fires, cryo testing, things of that nature. So not a lot of great spectacles to watch at the moment, but lots of things to look forward to in the very near future. Stuff that I will no doubt be able to talk about in upcoming episodes of Space This Week, so do remember to hit that subscribe button down below to get these videos every single Monday. The rapid pace of development at Starbase and the space industry in general, I guess, means that these videos are best enjoyed on their day of upload, so subscribing makes sure that you're getting these videos on time. And if you fancy it, give it a little like down below as well. It really helps support the channel uh, at the low price of nothing, and it's always very much appreciated. Anyway, I think trying to scratch my head, but I think that's all of the major Starship updates that happened last week that I wanted to talk about, so I'm going to wrap up the Starship portion there, but we still got lots of things to talk about with the rest of the space industry, from mishaps with Firefly Aerospace and setbacks with SLS and Virgin Galactic, so let's talk about all of that now. I'm going to start off with the news that, as I'm sure you've all heard by now, unfortunately things did not go well for Firefly's Alpha last week. Its maiden flight ended in an explosive failure on the 3rd of September. Now the launch initially went pretty well and we got a great shot of this thanks to the live stream hosted by our good friend Everyday Astronaut, but then it exploded two and a half minutes after liftoff. It's a real shame for the company, I was certainly hoping to see the 3D printed two stage small sat launch vehicle have a successful maiden flight. 3D printed rockets like this are a huge leap in innovation, imagine how quickly rockets could launch if this technology can be flight proven. Unlike many maiden flights, Firefly Alpha was carrying over 20 rideshare payloads as well as their experimental space utility vehicle, which of course were also sadly lost in the explosion. Scott Manley made a great video breaking down exactly what likely happened in the lead up to the explosion, so I highly recommend that if you haven't seen it already. Firefly's hopes of reaching orbit this year were dashed, but so was another space agency's. Last week, NASA warned that their hopes for a 2021 launch for SLS are waning, and it's probable that the forever delayed rocket won't see a debut flight until 2022 now. Hey, does anyone else remember when it was supposed to launch in 2016? I kind of can't believe that Starship, which was announced in 2016, will now almost certainly get to orbit first. Uh. Now, the best case scenario for an SLS flight will be spring 2022, but realistically, it'll probably be closer to summer 2022. NASA's Catherine Hamilton noted that the rise in COVID cases is to blame for this latest setback. It's becoming quite a tiresome wait, but hopefully it'll be worth it when we finally get to see this orange behemoth launch from the Kennedy Space Center in, uh, now 2022. Hopefully. Regardless, we do have a wet dress rehearsal to look forward to in the coming months, where the rocket will be stacked and fueled. After this, it'll be rolled back, and all will be needed will be a few final checks back at the vehicle assembly building, so keep your fingers and toes crossed for a spring launch. We have another disappointing set of news from another space agency, this time Virgin Galactic. Unfortunately, the US Federal Aviation Administration, or you know, FAA, has grounded Spaceship 2. Virgin Galactic's recent space flight, the big one with Richard Branson on board, unfortunately drifted off course during its climb. 
Course deviations are a big no-no with spaceflight, and as the vehicle had flown outside of its prearranged airspace, the FAA put their foot down and demanded they investigate. Virgin Galactic has stated that they're working in partnership with the FAA to address the issue and are taking the matter seriously. They did, however, reassure us that all passengers and crew were never in any danger as a result of the trajectory deviation, nor was the vehicle a danger to the public. Hopefully everything is resolved quickly and the space plane can make another flight soon and there are no further issues with the next craft, Spaceship 3. Anyway, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for last week. Bit of a downer really, but space is hard and sometimes failures and setbacks are an unfortunate part of the industry. But every mishap is a learning experience and so hopefully good things can eventually come from them. Anyway, that's it for my coverage of last week, so now let's take a look at what we'll be seeing this week. It's going to be a very busy week for China, who plan to launch three orbital rockets this week. First up, on the 6th of September, we have a Long March 4C carrying the GFN-5 Earth Observation Satellite into low Earth orbit from the Taiwan launch site. The GFN satellites are high-resolution Earth imaging satellites launched by the China Aerospace and Technology Corporation for the Chinese National Space Administration. These satellites are used in land surveys, road network design, crop yield estimation, urban planning and disaster relief. Next up, on the 9th of September, we'll have a Long March 3BE take to the skies from the Zichang launch site with the ChinaSat 9B communication satellite on board. The rocket will place the satellite into geosynchronous Earth orbit. After this, on the 12th of September, a Long March 2C will launch from the Jiuquan launch site, carrying two Yeogen reconnaissance satellites into low Earth orbit on behalf of the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation. These Earth observation satellites are used for scientific experiments as well as land surveys and disaster management. While China has a busy week ahead, we'll also be seeing a Soyuz 2.1V launch from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome. This will be placing a single Razberg reconnaissance satellite into low Earth orbit on behalf of the Russian Ministry of Defense. Given the relatively low mass of just the one satellite, this Soyuz, as I'm sure you can see from the footage, looks a little bit different from what we're used to seeing. It won't be sporting its iconic four boosters around the core stage, but will be a single booster in a much more lightweight configuration. Let's hope it still matches the legendary reliability of the Soyuz vehicle, and this flight goes without a hitch. The final thing to look forward to this week will be a spacewalk at the International Space Station. This was supposed to take place on the 3rd of September, but will now probably be taking place at some point this week instead. It'll be a roughly 7-hour EVA at the International Space Station by Russian cosmonauts Oleg Novitsky and Pyotr Dubrov, who will work on outfitting the newly docked Naoka module, as well as retrieve and replace two exposure experiments from the Poisk module and bring them inside. And with all that said and done, that's it for everything to get cited for this week week which brings an end to this week's episode of space this week i said week a lot just then in that sentence didn't i wow anyway guys thank you so much for watching if you enjoyed what you saw then remember to leave a like down below and if you want to support the channel you can do what these lovely folk on the left did and join my patreon a link to which is in the description and also on screen as well as two video suggestions for my channel hopefully they're good picks for you you can also join my channel by clicking the join button below the video and you can also write comments i'm told also and and that I really ran out of steam on that last bit. <laughs> so thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next Monday.